Om Namo Narayanaya. This is a recording of a talk of James Swartz on the Bhagavad Gita at Yoga Vidya Bad Meinberg near Hanover in Germany. Om Brahmanandam Paramasukadam Kevalam Yanamurtim Tondwati Tam Kanganasadusham Tatumasya Dilaksham Ekam nityam vimalamachalam sarvadi sakshi bhutam bhavati tam triguna rahitam sadgurum tam namami narayanam padma bhavam vashishtam shaktim chatat putta parasarancha vyasam sukam gaurapadam mahantam Ovinda Yogin Ramatas Yashisham Sri Shankaracharya Matasya Padma Padam Chastamalakan Chishisham Tam Totikam Bhartika Karamanyan Asmad Gurum Shantatamana Toshmi Vishwam Dharpanadrishamaninagari Tuliam nijan targetam Pasyan atmani mayaya by Horibod Bhutam yata nidraya Yasakshat kuti prabuddha samaye Swatmana meva dvayam Tasmai shri guru murtaye namaidam Shri dakshina murtaye namahavum Om Govinda <coughs> Narayana. If you, chapter 6, meditation. If you renounce prescribed rituals but perform no other actions, you're not a karma yogi. A karma yogi does action without attachment to result. Renunciation is actually karma yoga because you can't become a karma yogi without giving up attachment to results. For a discriminating person who wishes to obtain a contemplative disposition, karma yoga is the means. For someone who is already contemplative, complete renunciation is the means. You have attained liberation when you're no longer attached to sense objects or to action and you remove the cause of desire. The cause of desire is ignorance of yourself. Lift up yourself by yourself. Do not destroy yourself. So the first uh, qualification for uh, meditation is self-confidence. Self-grace. You have to grace yourself. This is the last... This is the last chapter in the self-effort section of the of the Gita. We're going to take Ishwara as an aid, but before we rely on Ishwara, we need to rely on ourselves. So, first six chapters here are, are to encourage us to do what's right for ourselves spiritually. You have to have confidence that you can succeed. And you have to do the work. You have to bless yourself with the desire to do the work and the confidence that you can succeed. It says here, huh, it says, uh, do not destroy yourself. It says, lift up yourself by yourself. Don't destroy yourself. Destroy yourself means thinking you're not worthy, you're not good enough. There's something wrong with you. You can't succeed. It's too difficult. How can I do it? This is only for great beings. Blah, 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 blah. These are all limiting self-doubt doubts that you have. And you need to have a confidence to that you can succeed. You are your best friend. You have to look after yourself. You have to love yourself. You have to be your friend to yourself. That's what confidence is. Confidence is loving yourself and taking care of yourself. 
Because you're your best friend if you master your, yourself. If not, you're your own worst enemy. So you're not talking about Bhagawan here. <laughs> <laughs> talking about Jiva. You have, to, you have to believe in yourself. You have to think you're good. You're wonderful. And you can do it. The self-controlled mind is composed in the face of heat and cold, pleasure and pain, praise and criticism. Another qualification is a self integration We said karma yoga. Obviously you need to have karma yoga in place or all you're going to be doing is fighting with your vasanas when you're meditating. You, you all went into meditation very nicely so you obviously don't have any serious vasana load. And the other, uh, the other qualification is uh, what's called self-integration. When, when, the, when the vasanas are, are too strong, when they're too powerful, when your desires and your fears are too intense, it creates a lot of pressure inside. And that pressure, you see, in this, in this chart, you see how nicely organized these three centers are? They're like a perfectly balanced, an isosceles triangle. They're, they're equidistant from each other. And ideally, they should be all communicating with each other behind a single idea. Your thoughts should be uh, thoughts of the self. Your actions should be karma yoga, serving the self. Your actions should serve the self. And your emotions should be loving the self, should be loving yourself. So all these three parts of your interest, inner, of your subtle body, should be in yoga. That's called yoga. They should be all joined or connected. And each should be in its proper place. The intellect should be on top. And the ego and the mind should be under, under the power, under the control of the intellect. These, the, huh? it, now when, that's a normal, that's a healthy integrated personality. That's a healthy person when that condition is taking place inside. But when the vasanas are extremely strong and powerful, what happens? These, the relationship between these low, this higher part of the subtle body and the lower part of the subtle body gets reversed. That's one thing. It gets reversed. And, and your intellect, you use your in intellect to justify and explain all your emotions. It's like, you know, in the old days, the queens had what are called handmaidens. Queens, rich people, aristocrats, they had a woman, a woman. Uh, and that woman uh, was a constant companion of the queen. She was called a handmaiden because she, she took care of the queen, she dressed her and so forth and so on. But what did she used to do? She told the queen everything the queen wanted to hear. She made sure the queen felt really good about herself. That was her job. She was a confidant. And what happens when there's too much pressure here, your intellect, huh? the, th the, th the situation is reversed, and your emotions and your actions become the most powerful part of your personality and your intellect becomes subordinate, and the intellect, what justifies all sorts of rajasic activities and all sorts of what? Useless emotions. This is what's happened to Arjuna. He's got reasons why he doesn't want to do what he has to do. Because structurally, 
there's a distortion. This situation has caused such an inner conflict, it's turned everything upside down. And it's distorted the fundamental relationship, the natural relationship that uh, is that Bhagawan has created for all of us. We're naturally harmonious and beautiful beings. We're naturally stress-free beings. But when your karma is too great, your vasanas are too powerful, then you get out of balance. You're no longer integrated. And these three people come become enemies. You find yourself saying things that you don't believe. You find yourself doing actions that doing certain actions and say, and saying one thing and doing something else. They becomes conflict. That's called v yoga, and this this whole con this 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 inner center gets distorted. These two these two sides come together. This side is excluded. These two come together. That's excluded, and so forth and so on. There's a big structural distortion. And karma yoga should is supposed to take care of that structural distortion by what? By m removing the pressure coming from your vasanas, from your karma load. We're reducing our karma. By reducing our karma, by taking this attitude, we reduce our vasanas. Reducing that, changing that attitude reduces the vasanas, which also reduces the karma. So on both ends, on the kasana end and on the karma end, we're like what? Reducing, reducing. And that allows your inner center to come back in touch. And you keep your mind, what? You always keep your desire. You have this burning desire to be free. That will keep you what? That will keep you on the right track always. So that the intellect tells the truth to your emotions. And the intellect controls your actions. Understand? You, you need to have the intellect in charge. This intellect should have this knowledge. And you should be running your life from knowledge. Not from emotions and not from mindless desires. Desires are, are, are motivating all these actions. And producing all kinds of emotions. Then those shouldn't be what's the charge. So it, it, the, these, those are they're, they're, these four qualifications are necessary for meditation. One is that is is karma yoga. We mentioned that, so, which is going to integrate your personality, and what self effort and self confidence. Those, uh, if those qualifications are there, then you're in good shape. And that's why he says you're your best friend if you master yourself. A lot of people don't have confidence. And a lot of people don't succeed in meditation because they're not taught, they're not integrated, and they're not taught karma yoga. So they lose spiritual confidence. <laughs> confidence you build in spirituality by doing the right thing spiritually. It's the same as confidence in the world. If you're going to do spirituality, you should do it professionally. Huh? If, you, if you're going to do, huh? If you do things professionally, you will have great confidence in yourself. If you just dabble in it, huh? And you don't really commit yourself to it totally, then, uh, huh? Then you won't succeed, and then your confidence will go down. So this is why we're sa this is why we're saying, look at this as a professional thing. Take a professional attitude toward this. Take it seriously. Dedicate yourself to it. And do the work, you know, vow to do the work and keep that discipline of doing that work over and over and over again because your confidence is going to build daily as you practice. So, it's in here. And if not, the self-controlled mind is composed, so what? So that means what? No matter what's happened, if your mind is self-controlled and you're self-confident and you've got your karma yoga in practice, and you're living the right kind of sattvic life, then what? Then no matter what happens in the in physically in your body, these are two sensations in the body, pleasure and pain, and then praise and criticism, whatever intellectual stuff comes from other people. People people criticize you and blame you all the time. And you criticize and blame yourself. And so 
if you have that commitment and that strong sense of self-confidence, these things won't bother you. That's what he said. And then you're good to go for meditation. And he said, you're, and then he says, you're self-realized when you no longer uh, try to connect the senses. Again, the same idea, huh? Not trying to like change your experience. Uh, you, you're self-realized when you no longer try to connect the senses with their objects. And the mind sits still because it knows that it, it is the self. See how nice it is when your mind s settles into that silence and just sits there? I mean, we really didn't need to talk. We could have just sat for an hour and then gone home for lunch. Or you can sit for hours. It's very just really happy. The mind is happy feeling that peace and feeling that bliss. Staying with yourself all the time. Ramana Maharshi says, uh, inquiry is, is holding the mind on the self, keeping the mind there in that inner state, in that silence, in that peace. Uh, enjoying that. And then thinking. I, uh, I, You don't have to be a big intellectual to realize. You don't have to be a genius. Okay? Just a, a person of average intelligence, even below average intelligence, can get realized. It's not an intellectual thing. The, all these qualities are not just about being intellectual and being smart. They're, they're all the other there's so many qualities, and if you have those qualities, I, years ago I, I met a woman by very strange, very weird circumstances. I totally, it was totally Ishwar. There's just no way that it, could, it wasn't Ishwar. I didn't have any desire to meet her, and she didn't have any desire to meet me. <laughs> and it happened in the most bizarre way. It was just, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget it. And uh, she was a long-time meditator. She was actually a rebirth yogi. She was one of these avatars who realized in her past life, and then it appeared here. And when she was 15, she started to spontaneously meditate. She wasn't actually an avatar, but she was an avatar type. Let's say she was a rebirth yogi. And um, when she was 15, she was an upper class uh, Sri Lankan woman from Sri Lanka, actually from a Buddhist family. And uh, she was Sinhalese and a Buddhist. And she, one day when she was 15, she went to her uncle and she got a, asked him for a deer skin. He was a hunter. And she got a deer skin from her hunter, or from her uncle, and then she went home and she locked herself in her room and sat on the deer skin and went into meditation just spontaneously. And sat there for days. The family was totally was like banging on the door and trying to get in and raising hell. And she was just in deep meditation. And she became a, a serious meditator. And she meditated for like 30 years. I met her in India where she was involved in some meditation. With some meditation guru at that time. And we became friends. And uh, she was a great lady. And uh, one day, she came to me. And she said, I never really said anything about Vedanta. A little bit. I talked a little bit about it. But I didn't make a big issue about it or anything. I wasn't trying to recruit her or teach her or anything like that, really. I just liked her. And, and one day she came to me and said, uh, Hey, Ram, can I ask you a question? And I said, uh, Yeah, you bet. And she said, I said, What is it? She said, Well, wherever I go, and what she meant by go is, she used to go to all these different lokas. There are, there are hundreds of different planes of ex inner experience in the in the spiritual side of the causal body. These are called lokas. They're, they're not physical lokas like here, but they're locations in consciousness where there are all, they're worlds, where there are jivas and various 
things taking place. Some are purely material, some there are jivas and so forth. And she visited hundreds of these places. She'd been meditating for 35 years. She could have written a book about all that, but she wasn't the literary type or wasn't interested in in fame or publishing. Or She never even talked to anybody about it. She just meditated because it was she liked, loved doing it. And she said, you know, wherever I go, there's something watching me. Now, mind you, her senses are shut down, her mind is quiet, and she's traveling into all these different dimensions, inner dimensions, worlds. She said, wherever you go, there's something watching me. What is that? I spent about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes teaching her the self, telling her about the self, what it was, explaining it. She said, oh, thank you. And she went away. And then about three weeks later, I, I was sitting in my room, I was writing in my books, and I felt this really strong presence. And I looked, and there she was standing in the doorway. And her, her, she just radiant, like a saint. Just radiance. It was boom! And like, the energy was so astounding. And she just said, she said, I am the self. My work is done. Now, what had happened there? And it's still true today that she, that I had shifted from what? The one that was being watched to the one that was watching. As I told her, that, that one that's watching is you. Not the one that's being watched. She was aware. Huh? The jiva was aware that there was another presence there that was watching it. The jiva is a reflection of awareness. And there, because of her meditation and her, her extreme sattva, huh, she became, she started to feel the presence of this uh, self there, but she didn't know it was her. And then and when I told her that, after three weeks, the shift, she kept meditating, but what? She shifted the eye from what? From the jiva to the awareness. And she made the right statement. I'm, my work is done. My work is finished. So, basically, meditation is, uh, the, you know, now you don't have to meditate to have that shift, okay? That doesn't mean go sit down and do that and shift the, shift the yourself. That, that meditation is one option. You can make that shift simply by discriminating in your daily life without sitting in meditation. But meditation is a very, very uh, excellent way to isolate that seer, that non-experiencing witness. Because you notice you could feel, huh? you could see the mind throwing up little thoughts, you could hear the sounds coming from the material world, from the space, from the space uh, element. And you could see your body sitting there, but, and, and you could feel the bliss, but how was it known? Who's watching? Who's illumining that experience? Who's, who's having a look? Who's seeing that? Who's watching? Without comment. That that eye, that that third eye, <laughs> that other eye, that peer witness, it's always just watching. It's not making a comment. It's not judging anything, it's not doing anything. It's just there shining all the time. And what and so this the teaching is what meant to shift your identity from this one uh, this person to that eye that's always watching, that's always present. So that's what mm, and these qualifications are basically required there. Dover doesn't say anything about you have to have a college degree <laughs> or anything of the sort. This person had never actually been to university. I don't even know if she'd actually finished uh, high school or not. But it didn't matter. So, 
So, uh, so the, the, there's that shift. That's what it's talking about here. This mind, and then what happens from that point on? This mind sees no difference between a clod of earth and a lump of gold. Exalted is the mind that sees no difference between a friend and an enemy, a saint and a sinner. <coughs> The meditator who is free from longing should remain relaxed and alone and constantly unite his or her mind to the self. Keep bringing your attention back to that silence. Obviously you can't put it on the self directly because the self is not an object. But you can put it on the what? The reflection of the self. When the mind is still, the subtle body is made of sattva guna. The gunas create these three bodies. The gunas create the, the the subtle body comes from sattva guna, the prana the prana maya kosha and the sense organs of action come from raja guna, and what and the and the perceptive organs come from from sattva guna, and the material aspect comes from what tama guna. So so this this subtle body is sattvic. It's pure sattva. It's a reflector. I said that original prakriti was broken up into these all these subtle bodies, and the subtle body is still a reflective mirror. Ishwar is just a great big mirror, that just uh, a huge mirror that just re- re- reflects the totality of awareness. And then it, in the second stage, Raja Guna splits that mirror up into all these little jivas. So we're all just small Ishwaras. We're all reflection, reflecting awareness. And what? Our subtle body is reflecting awareness. So the self is always appearing there as what? As the light that's shining in the subtle body. Hmm? That's pure sattva. It's a state of pure sattva. And there what? The self becomes aware of itself, you could say, through that practice, through that effort, that meditation. To, and, and when you see your attention wandering away from that, just pull it back. And then after a while, you don't have to pull it back. Why you start to like, no, sink into it. Oh my God, this is good. Why would I run away from this? This feels really nice. I think I'll just sit here and be happy. Because well, the mind is satisfied with that bliss, with that peace. That's, that's just what, just the experience of your own Self. This is how you experience yourself. So you're constantly experiencing yourself, but uh, I don't see it. Why? Or I don't feel it. I don't experience. I don't experience the experience of myself because my mind is distracted, and I, I keep watching my mind. Just like you experience the the light, but you don't see the light. You see the hand. Even though you see the light, you don't see the light. Right? The same idea is operating here. So he says, to meditate for the purification of the mind, one... Now what happens, what what does he mean by the purification of the mind here? He said, what happens to the vasanas when they arrive in in, in the silence? They dissolve into the silence, don't they? Where do those thoughts, those thoughts that arise in the silence, where do they go? back into the silence. Where do the sounds go? The sounds come out of the silence, and then what do they do? They go back into the silence, don't they? Well, if a vasana or a thought comes into the mind, and it doesn't get acted out, what's going to happen to it? Will it get reinforced? (laughs) No, it won't get reinforced, will it? it'll burn out. So by holding your mind on the self, what are you doing? You're just burning vasanas, huh? Without doing any karma yoga at all. (laughs) It's a more subtle or advanced technique. By just holding my mind on the self, what? The vasanas get burned up in the meditation. And they don't reinforce, so what? So the mind becomes purified through that practice. 
And to do that, one should keep the senses in check. We already did that. We we got rid of our sense or the sense organs. Then we got into the prana body. That was the next. And then we got into the subtle body. That was the next. Then we got our our thoughts calmed down. And then we just were experiencing the reflection of awareness in the subtle body here. And and then from then on, huh, it's automatic vasana purification, just through meditation. So, what should you do? Sit in a quiet, clean place, a firm seat. You don't have to sit on the ground like a yogi if you can. If you can sit on the ground like a yogi, great. You can sit in a chair. You can lie in bed as long as you don't go to sleep. <laughs> and if you do go to sleep, it's okay. But it's easier to sit up and just find a comfortable seat. Uh, when the mind is pure, fearless, and focused on the silence, continually contemplate on the self. Continually look for that witness. Think about that witness. Huh? Liberation happens what? When the mind is completely absorbed in this, in the self. You uh, see this woman, I mean, she, she'd been 30 years and slowly, slowly, at first she wasn't aware that she was being watched. And then slowly, 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 huh, it became clear that she was being watched. And then she had a question. This is weird. What's going on? Who's watching me? There's somebody else here. She never thought there was anybody else there. She didn't know it was herself that was watching, that was always present. And then that shift took place, that identity moved from the jiva to the self. And uh, and if you have a problem with meditation, what does it say here? Obstacles. Meditation does not work for gluttons, fasters, insomniacs, and excessive sleepers. However, it destroys the sorrow of a person with moderate habits who does not work too much or is too much lazy. Buddha you call that madhyamika, the middle way. Moderate habits. Sin intelligently, my girl used to say. That was his teaching. Sin intelligently. Don't deny yourself too much. Don't indulge yourself too much. Throw the boss and a dog a bone once in a while. He needs a bone. Whatever it is. Give it to him. Make it happy. Then get back on the path. Important. Otherwise, if you control too much, your mind's going to be, there's going to be too much tension. And that agitation will keep you from meditation. The mind of an accomplished meditator, ter- meditator, Meditator does not long for objects because it's gained composure through its contemplation on the self. You just feel good. Why would you want to go out and experience anything else? You're not going to get any better bliss by chasing some sort of object, are you? Are you going to feel more happy and peaceful by chasing some object? No, you're not. So your mind just stays still. It just sits there in the silence and enjoys just sipping that blissful nectar. Mm. I'm a fisherman. I we have, have a home on a really nice river in, in western Oregon, and there's a certain kind of hatch that comes out of insects at at uh, in the evening, and you'll see the fish. They 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 they're lazy, and they'll just sit there like this with their their mouth right just below the surface, and they just go. Just sucking in the insect. Maybe they move a little bit. You put the fly in front of them and then boom, grab them. <laughs> but they won't. They won't chase it usually because there's so many. You have to find exactly where they're sitting, and then you drop the fly right in front of them in a certain way, and then boom, you can catch them. But uh, this is a mind just like that. It just sits there sipping up bliss. Why would it run for? Go do it, huh? All these gross pleasures. Not, they just don't. They just don't have any attraction anymore. When you get that, when you're, you know, in that state of inner absorption on yourself. So, so. When the mind is mastered by the practice of meditation, it abides in the self. It rejoices in the self alone. And when the happiness that is beyond the senses is recognized, the intellect becomes rooted in the self. It means what? The eye has shifted to the self and never moves away from it. After gaining this happiness, 
if you do not try to gain a greater happiness, I had a friend once who said he was enlightened, and then he he was running around, he was on a big sex trip. I said, what are you doing? So I'm just adding a little more happiness. <laughs> huh? Don't try to gain a greater happiness and, and are even unaffected by tragic events. This transcendence of sorrow is yoga. It doesn't mean you won't feel bad when things happen. It means those feelings will just disappear quickly. You won't dwell on those feelings. It's natural to feel sad when you lose a friend or a relative or when something. It's natural to feel that, but those feelings won't, you won't make a story out of that. They'll just appear and they'll disappear, just like the thoughts in the silence. So that means they're unaffected. They'll experience, but what? Not affected. Yep. This transcendence of yoga, uh, sorrow, is yoga. Pursue this yoga with unflinching clarity of purpose. And at 3.30 this afternoon, we will continue with verse 24. Thank you for listening to the talk of James Wards on the Bhagavad Gita, recorded at Yoga Vidya Bad Meinberg near Hanover in Germany. More information on shiningworld.com and yoga-vidya.org.